Throughout the years, so-called white K-pop idols have always stirred tons of controversy. From accusations of cultural appropriation, to claims of Asian fetishization, to simply getting hated on for being cringy, each and every single one of these idols have seemingly gone viral for all the wrong reasons. But whilst recent names such as Kachi, Ali London, and EXP Media immediately come to mind, less people might be familiar with the person who actually started the trend, a man by the name of Chad Future. From creating the first Western K-pop band ever, to attempting a solo K-pop career, to collaborating with well-known artists like New S and Vix, Chad has been trying tirelessly to succeed in the industry for well over a decade now, which is honestly more than can be said for most actual K-pop artists. Now it's easy to assume that Chad Future was just a typical cringy wannabe K-pop idol, but upon doing further research, I discovered that K-pop is actually just the tip of the iceberg when when it comes to Chad Future's crazy life. And outside of his whole K-pop persona, he actually assumes a completely different identity by the name of David Lair. So who is David Lair? Well, it turns out he is in fact a respected music video director, has connections with the world's top music producers and celebrities, is friends with people like Jake Paul, and was once even the most watched YouTuber back in 2006. Yeah, he lived a crazy life. So why would a promising video director slash YouTuber choose to make himself a K-pop meme? And why hasn't he been able to succeed in the K-pop industry despite despite all his connections. Well, today we're going to be covering the bizarre life and career of the first white K-pop star, Chad Future. But before we begin, I wanted to thank today's sponsor, Opera. Opera is a free browser with a ton of amazing built-in features, and I almost feel sorry for my past self for not discovering it sooner. So let me show you some of my favorite things about this browser. Firstly, it contains a free built-in VPN. This feature is perfect for me because I often work in cafes and libraries where I have to connect to public Wi-Fi. So Opera's VPN helps ensure that my browsing data is kept safe and secure. Another thing that I love about Opera is that it helps me stay organized while browsing the internet. Now, if you're anything like me, then you know how confusing and overwhelming it can be to have millions of tabs and windows open. But thankfully, Opera solves this problem by having all your most useful apps like WhatsApp, Instagram, Spotify, etc. all in the sidebar. So instead of having to switch between a bunch of tabs to find Instagram Messenger, for example, I can just click here and reply to my messages easily. And it's the same thing with Spotify. I can just open it up like this and play my music. And as you can see, it just makes things so much more accessible and it helps keep my browser organized and clutter free. But my favorite feature by far has to be the pinboard function. This just allows me to collect web pages, pictures, notes, etc. and organize them into different boards. I found it really useful when doing research for my videos and I imagine it could be very helpful for things like school projects as well. As you can see, the Opera browser contains so many unique features and it just makes the entire web browsing experience so much more enjoyable and convenient. So I'm going to put the download link for Opera in the description and I'd highly recommend you guys check it out and give it a try. And huge thanks once again to Opera for supporting this channel. Also, quick disclaimer, this video isn't meant to be a hate piece, so please do not send hate to chat or any one else mentioned. And I also wanted to clarify that whenever I use the words white K-pop idols in quotation marks, I'm not referring to all white people who pursue K-pop. I actually talked about this more towards the end of this video, but I'm sure there are a lot of really hardworking white people who are actually, you know, training hard, trying to prepare for their debut, and I'm definitely not referring to them when I use the quotation marks. So I just wanted to clarify that, and yeah, with all that out of the way, let's jump straight into to it. Okay, so Chad Future was actually born David Lair in 1988. He grew up his entire life in Detroit, Michigan, and ever since he was a child, he had always dreamed of becoming part of the entertainment industry. And so, starting at the age of 12, David began working as a catalog model and actor. He then saved up all his earnings, and at just 17 years old, he used the money to purchase his first camera, lights, video editing software, and laptop. And he even began his own production 
production company, which he named Vendetta Studios. This was really when David discovered his talent for video editing and directing, and the company would eventually go on to film music videos for famous singers like Alison Stoner and Agnes Mo. Additionally, it was also around this time that David began filming and editing short skits of himself and his friends, making him essentially an early version of a content creator. And the Matrix Scrubber is so easy, you can clean up just about anything, anywhere, hey, anytime. Hey, I don't think that Matrix thing works very good. <laughs> Initially, David uploaded these videos to his own website, davidlair.com, where he amassed a small but loyal following. However, his big break came in 2006, when one of these videos, titled MySpace the Movie, got re-uploaded onto YouTube, and it went absolutely viral. I gotta show you a really, really hot girl on MySpace. Let's do it. Okay. Look, huh? Whoa! Yeah! Wow, who's this? Her name's Yita. Yita? Ooh. She's Eastern European. I like it. I've been talking to her online. Mm hmm She is beautiful. So I have a date with her at 7.30. Are you Dave? Yeah, are you Yita? No. That girl at the bar wants to talk to you. People absolutely fell in love with David's sense of humor and his amazing video editing skills, and the short film ended up amassing a whopping 3.4 million views in less than a month, which was unheard of for YouTube back in 2006. In fact, the video actually broke YouTube's records and became the most watched video on the entire website. This motivated David to finally create his own YouTube channel, where he began uploading more of his videos. Most of these videos were his signatures, skits, and parodies. However, he occasionally also uploaded music videos, and one of these music videos was by a boy band called Heat Street, which David had actually started with a couple of his friends. And interestingly, during his time in this Heat Street boy band, David actually went by the stage name Chad. I'm Chad, girl, Papa Cala for them. Now, at the time, David was known for his self-deprecating sense of humor. Besides, the song was pretty ridiculous anyways, so most people just automatically assumed that it must have been another one of his parodies. And David actually played into this as well, passing the entire thing off as a joke. But of course, as we now know, this video would actually mark the beginning of David's musical aspirations. Over the next few years, David would attempt many different ventures, and credit where credit is due, he was an absolute visionary. For instance, he was actually one of the first YouTubers to release merch. He also attempted to break out into mainstream media by taking on several acting roles. And in 2008, he even won Jimmy Kimmel's filmmaking contest and was interviewed on The Jimmy Kimmel Show. The winning entry came from a gentleman from Detroit. He's here to now, he's, there he is, David LaHare is his name. And he, you can see he's got his hair is exceptional. He made this video himself. I think he did a, a nice job. Overall, David was definitely a pioneer in the world of early YouTube. He came off as a self-aware YouTuber who wasn't afraid to make fun of himself. And his video editing and production quality were also considered top-notch, especially when compared to other YouTubers from that time period. But sadly, as the years passed, YouTube trends changed, and David's style of content slowly began to fall out of fashion. This caused his channel to stagnate, and his view count started to dwindle. As a result, in October of 2011, David uploaded what would be his last video, after which he completely abandoned his channel and seemingly disappeared from the face of YouTube. Or so it seemed. Just days after David's disappearance, the world was introduced to a boy band by the name of Heart to Heart. The group consisted of leader and producer Chad Future, as well as Pete, Brayden, Nico, and KX. In their debut song, Facebook Official, the group, which consisted of five non-Asian men, shocked the world by dressing in stereotypical K-pop clothing and makeup, as they sang questionable lyrics such as, 
Girl, you're so fine. Your picture is so hot. I am thinking dirty thoughts. The music video unsurprisingly went viral, and Heart to Heart quickly became the laughing stock of the internet. The initial knee-jerk reaction for most people was to laugh at the group's cringy facial expressions and styling, with many even calling them the second Rebecca Black. But on the flip side, the video was also so unbelievably cringy that many people assumed it must have been some sort of joke. People then began speculating that perhaps Heart to Heart was intentionally trying to mock and parody the K-pop genre. This then led to the group facing backlash for supposedly disrespecting Asian artists, with some going as far as to accuse the group of racism. It's so disrespectful how they're making fun of K-pop idols, one person said. The way that they're mocking Asian pop music is honestly borderline racist, another person commented. Getting cancelled for racism couldn't have been fun, but what was perhaps even more tragic was the fact that this group was never even supposed to be a parody in the first place, and the entire thing had in fact been a genuine effort. It was at this moment that he knew. He fucked up. See, the group had in fact been created by their leader, Chad Future, who was in fact David Lair. It turns out, David had actually fallen in love with K-pop back in 2009, after watching music videos from groups like 2NE1 and Big Bang. In his own words, I really identified with it a lot, with the style, with the sound, the wardrobe, the videos. Pretty much every aspect of K-pop was really my style. As David's love for K-pop grew, something in him seemed to snap. And the once self-aware YouTuber suddenly became convinced that he had what it took to become an idol. This was when he remembered his boy band Heat Street from years ago. Remember that? Well, he figured he could just bring that idea back but add more of a K-pop twist to it. And that was how Heart to Heart was born. David also drew inspiration from his Heat Street stage name, Chad, and modified it to Chad Future. And with this name change came a complete transformation in his style and general demeanor. He began experimenting with weird hairstyles and dressing in a way that resembled the stereotypical 2010s K-pop aesthetic. He also exchanged his sarcastic and self-deprecating sense of humor for a much more family-friendly, idol-like image, occasionally even doing things like Aegyo. And to top it all off, he even managed to get himself a Korean girlfriend who he was in a relationship with for two years. By the end of his transformation, Chad Future and David Lair looked and acted like two completely different people. And it's honestly no surprise that even up till today, many people still have no idea that they were in fact the same individual. But he wasn't the only member of Heart to Heart who was unrecognizable, because unbeknownst to everyone, it turns out there were actually a few other members of the group who were also big names in the entertainment industry. The lead vocalist Pete, for instance, was in fact Logan Paul. <laughs> he wasn't Logan Paul, but they look so similar. Am I the only one who's seeing it? Okay, but Pete was actually Cody Singh New, who's an actor you may recognize from shows like Teen Wolf, Criminal Minds, and House. There was also the rapper Brayden, who is in fact Colby Coat, a respected director who has worked on TV shows like The Biggest Loser and Lip Sync Battle. And the main dancer, KX, is in fact Kai McMinn, who is actually now a famous Twitch streamer. None of these members have ever acknowledged your time in Heart to Heart for obvious reasons, and I guess in the end, the horrendous makeup and styling actually turned out to be a blessing, because even today, nobody seems to recognize them from their time in the group. But if the member lineup wasn't already crazy enough, Heart to Heart's music video actually also featured cameos from even more celebrities, such as NSYNC member Lance Bass, and famous YouTubers like Blair Fowler and Bethany Moda. And the most impressive thing is that all of this was single-handedly put together by Chad Future, aka David Lair. He had apparently been responsible for recruiting everyone involved. And I have to say, it's actually crazy how he was able to convince so many famous people to basically put their reputations on the line for his K-pop dream. Unfortunately though, it seemed even the star-studded lineup couldn't save Heart to Heart from their disastrous song, and the group ended up disbanding just shortly after their debut. But Chad's efforts weren't completely in vain, because it turns out the music video had actually caught the attention of Drew Scott, a renowned producer who worked with famous K-pop groups like 
Girls' Generation, TVXQ, and Shiny. Drew reportedly reached out to Chad and the two quickly became close friends. This friendship would turn out to be extremely beneficial for Chad because Drew introduced him to a bunch of important contacts within the Korean entertainment industry. And this would pretty much go on to explain how Chad secured all his opportunities throughout the rest of his K-pop career. In 2012, Chad returned to the music scene as a solo artist. This time, he claimed that he was going to bridge the gap between American pop and Korean pop by creating a whole new genre, which he creatively named American Korean Pop. He then created a new YouTube channel for his Chad Future persona, and he began uploading these hilarious inspirational videos where he would portray himself as some sort of trendsetter or pioneer who was going to completely revolutionize the entire entire entertainment industry. It takes someone to stand up for what they believe in, a new idea, a new concept, to really change the world. Once the people see one person actually do it, then it becomes real. Finally, in August that year, Chad made his official debut with the songs Hello. and unstoppable. These songs weren't really much better than Facebook official, and he unsurprisingly got memed on once again by viewers. But despite the lackluster response, Chad somehow managed to use his connections to get himself invited to huge events like KCON, where he performed to a very confused audience. During this time, Chad Future also began uploading English covers of popular K-pop songs on his YouTube channel. To his credit, all of these covers were professionally mixed, filmed, and edited, and they even included background dancers and different sets and outfits. But despite all of this, his covers were initially not well received, with many even claiming that he had butchered these K-pop songs. However, this would all change on the 8th of April 2013, when Chad uploaded his cover of BAP's One Shot. Unlike his previous solo covers, this time he actually invited his friend Drew Scott, as well as another singer by the name of Jeremy Thurber to join him. And let's just say Drew and Jeremy absolutely slayed in the vocal department. The cover was so impressive that even the people who had originally clicked on the video to hate watch Chad were left feeling absolutely shocked and speechless. And it even caught the attention of BAP member Daehyun, who shared it on his Twitter, causing the video to go even more viral. This was the first time that Chad's work had ever received any positive recognition, and it was clear to him that people enjoyed his covers that he did with his friends more than his solo covers. So he began collaborating with his friends more and more, to the point where almost all of his covers were collaborations. And sure enough, they all did really well, averaging around 500,000 views and receiving great like-to-dislike ratios. Collaborations were clearly the way to go for Chad, so in 2014, when he decided to make a comeback with his first mini-album, it seemed like a no-brainer that, of course, the album would have to feature collaborations. But Chad didn't just want this to be any regular collab, he wanted the album to be bigger and better than anything else he had ever released. So he decided that this time, he was actually going to try and reach out to K-pop idols. I guess he also figured that working with K-pop idols could help him establish legitimacy as an artist, and he probably hoped that their positive reputations would somehow rub off on him as well. So he reached out to his contacts within the K-pop industry and was actually able to secure collaborations with Newest's Aaron, who featured on the track Got It Figured Out, and Vix's Ravi, who featured on the track Rock the World. 
Fun fact, Ravi actually flew all the way from Korea to LA just to record this song with Chad Future. If that isn't proof that Chad had some crazy connections, then I don't know what is. And then in 2015, he came back with his second album, which featured yet more collaborations with top K-pop idols and industry professionals. The album was apparently produced by Shin Hyuk, a renowned composer who has worked with groups like NCT and Monster X. And the track list included songs such as So Good, which featured Besties Yuji, and Famous, which featured Ha Sung Woo. Just as Chad had hoped, all of these songs were relatively well received, and the music video that he filmed with Vix's Ravi even managed to break 1 million views. On the surface, it seemed like things were finally going smoothly for Chad. Ever since he started doing collabs, his work had been receiving positive feedback. People now liked his K-pop covers, and they liked his songs, so surely that meant that they liked him too, right? I mean, surely by this point, after so many good releases, he had finally earned the respect of the K-pop community, right? Well, this is where things get juicy. It seemed Chad had become over-reliant on collaborations to get him by, and upon looking at his comments section, it becomes apparent that every single person Chad had ever collaborated with somehow managed to outshine him in his own videos. In the K-pop covers that he did with his friends, his friends were the ones who mostly carried the songs, taking on all the high notes and the hard parts, whereas Chad mostly just stuck to doing his mediocre raps and sang all the easy lines. Viewers seemed to have noticed this, and most of the positive comments Chad was getting on these videos were actually directed towards his friends rather than himself. But things get even worse when looking at Chad's collaborations with K-pop idols. Although he had originally collaborated with these idols to prove his legitimacy, the plan seemed to have backfired on him. Instead of arousing feelings of awe and respect, fans were mostly just confused that these idols were even willing to work with him in the first place, with some of them even making jokes that the idols must have been held hostage. Additionally, many of the top comments were saying hurtful things along the lines of how the song would have been better without Chad, how the K-pop idol was the only thing saving the song, and how they were only watching this video purely to support the idol. There were even commenters who posted timestamps to the idol's parts in the songs just so that they could skip Chad's verses altogether. I mean, it was blatantly obvious that all the likes and views that Chad had been receiving this entire time weren't actually directed at him, but rather at the people that he featured. And this was further proven by the fact that on the rare occasions where Chad would upload a solo song or cover, they would only receive a fraction of the views compared to his collaborations. People also didn't seem to be very interested in his personal life, with most of his behind the scenes and Q&A videos barely getting any views. In 2016, Chad actually released a documentary showing how he went to Korea to prepare for his second album. The documentary series was professionally filmed and advertised across multiple TV stations in America. Yet despite all of this, most of the episodes couldn't even crack 11,000 views. Though I guess that was actually a good thing because he was being kind of disrespectful throughout his time in Korea. this stand there and I'm like I'm like is this okay it's no problem no problem no shut up and dump <laughs> I hope the wind or hurt it was actually during the filming of this documentary that Chad seemed to have come to the realization that despite all his efforts and despite all the time and money he had put in throughout the years, he still hadn't been able to gain the acceptance of the K-pop community. And this made Chad feel burnt out. He didn't know where to go from here, and the negative comments were clearly starting to get to him. During the last episode of the series, Chad seemed lost and unsure of whether he even wanted to continue learning Korean, which was definitely a huge change in attitude compared to his early inspirational videos. So now I need to decide, do I want to continue my Korean language studies for the rest of my life, or do I not? Well, the answer was, he didn't.
In June of 2016, Chad made a video announcing that he was finally going to be giving up on K-pop. The video was unfortunately taken down before I had the chance to watch it, but according to comments, he apparently claimed that he was going to be debuting in a new American boy band. However, nothing ended up coming out of this, and it was after this video that he seemingly abandoned his Chad Future persona and channel completely. Instead, he suddenly went back to posting as David Lair again, uploading comedy sketches, reaction videos, and parodies just like he had done years ago. He also began focusing more on his video directing career, filming music videos for big artists like Lil Pump. He even became friends with Jake Paul of all people. And he helped Jake and the Team 10 House film several vlogs and music videos. Fans of David Lair were both surprised and happy to see him back on YouTube. Many of them, who were obviously unaware of his Chad future face, assumed that he had left the internet back in 2011, and they really missed him, so they were just glad to see that he was finally uploading videos again. Meanwhile, K-pop fans were also celebrating, as they rejoiced over the disappearance of K-pop's biggest enemy, Chad Future. You won't be missed, one person said. The evil has finally been defeated, another person celebrated. It seemed that with Chad Future gone and with David Lair restored, peace had finally befallen the internet and the K-pop community. Or so everyone thought. For about the next four years, Chad's channel would remain dormant, and what was once Chad Future soon became Chad from the past, as his legacy slowly faded into a forgotten and distant footnote in K-pop history. I used to live in Korea, I was living there for one year. However, the issue of Korea booze and wannabe K-pop idols was anything but forgotten. In fact, it was during this period of time that the K-pop community experienced perhaps the biggest surge of white K-pop idols they had ever seen. From EXP Media to Kachi to Ali London, these people were coming out of the woodwork, and many of them were arguably much more extreme and controversial than even Chad Future himself. Ali London in particular was definitely the worst offender of them all, getting hundreds and thousands of dollars worth of plastic surgery to look Korean, and even making claims that he was transracial. I'm Korean, you know, people need to accept that. He definitely pushed the limits of what was considered considered controversial to new heights. So much so that by the time Chad Future made his unexpected return in late 2021, he was barely even considered scandalous anymore. And if anything, he was actually considered tame by the new standards. Fans now honestly had much bigger battles to fight, and so Chad's comeback went largely unnoticed, barely attracting any attention or interest. In his comeback video titled Update, Chad revealed that he had taken a hiatus because he was feeling burnt out, but he was now back to recording new songs. I am so, so excited about this music. It sounds so good. Since then, he has gone back to releasing more English K-pop covers with his friends, though these videos are definitely not pulling in the same views as back during his heyday. It seems both his fans and his haters have largely lost interest in Chad Future, and so at least for now, it looks like Chad has been out done and outcompeted by his contemporaries. But of course, we can't forget that this is Chad Future, aka David Lair that we're talking about. And considering all the unbelievable stunts he has pulled so far, there's really no saying what he will do next. Will he have another viral video? Will he come up with another crazy idea? Will he be able to reclaim the throne as the most controversial white K-pop idol? I guess only time will tell. I honestly just find this entire story so baffling and I have so many thoughts. I guess firstly, I just find it difficult to comprehend how David Lair and Chad Future could be the same person. I mean, upon watching David Lair's channel, you would assume that someone with his level of self-awareness would surely know better than to try and debut as some sort of K-pop inspired idol. Yet Chad Future seemed completely oblivious of this and at times he even acted like he was some sort of inspiration 
innovation or pioneer in the K-pop genre, which I just find <laughs> super hilarious. The discrepancy between these two personalities has led to some speculations that the whole Chad future persona might be more of a social experiment or a joke. But considering how much money and time he invests in his music videos, I, I highly doubt that this is a joke and I think that he actually takes this seriously. And I guess this leads to the bigger question of whether white people can ever become legitimate K-pop idols. I actually spoke to several of my Korean and other Asian friends about this, and we all basically had the same conclusion, which is that none of us had a problem with it. I guess the issue at the moment is that most of the so-called white K-pop idols that we've seen so far haven't actually gone through the K-pop training process, and their skills simply do not match up to actual K-pop idols. And I kind of feel like that problem applies to Chad Future as well. Like, to be fair, I don't think he's the worst rapper out there, and he actually does have quite a few decent covers and songs. But considering his lack of singing and dancing skills, as well as his inability to speak fluent Korean, we're both like Jurchen. We're Jurchen. I just don't see him measuring up to the standard of most K-pop idols today. But anyways, those are just my thoughts on Chad Future and the whole issue of white K-pop idols. And I'm honestly interested to know what you guys think. Let me know your opinions in the comment section down below. And if you enjoyed this video, then be sure to give it a thumbs up and subscribe. And with all that said, I'll see you guys next time. Bye!